Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's, great. it's great to see you this morning. Would you stand and greet those around you this morning?
welcome each and every one of you out to Madison today. Got a, you know, it feels like summer's here. School's done, Memorial Day's over, and uh, I know we have people missing, but we have visitors, and we just are grateful that you've decided to worship with us and uh, lift up the name of the Lord together. It's always special when his people get together, so thanks for making it special for us today. Just a couple announcements we want to make you aware of. Um, next week, we're just doing an all-church outing to Diamond Lake. That's down by Montezuma, and uh, we've reserved shelter number two. We will uh, post something on our Facebook page, or we'll put something in next week's bulletin, a map where shelter number two is, and you can meet us here at 5 o'clock, or if you want to go down early, we have the shelter reserved at 3 o'clock, but uh, you could help us by bringing a a side dish and a dessert, and uh, we'll provide some meat of some sort, and we'll just have a good time together. Hopefully the weather will be good, but uh, if you, we'll have some kayaks and some canoes, and we'll just have a good time and enjoy the fellowship and being outdoor and in God's creation. So join us next week. You can meet here at 5, or you can go down there, and again, we have that from 3 o'clock throughout the evening, and um, we'll, we'll hope to see you there. Bring a friend if you think they would enjoy that as well. Um, this week, we also serve meals at Senior Dining at the, in Brooklyn, and if you could do Tuesday, if someone has Tuesday noon from like 11.30 to 12.30 free, see Brianna, and we could use your help by serving that meal that, down there. And lastly, uh, Vacation Bible School is rapidly approaching, and uh, we have a few slots we'd love to have your help with. Um, it's just a great way to minister to kids. Uh, young people are great resources, great, great leaders. You know, most people think they're the... the the future church, but in reality, they're, they're much the part of the church today, too, and so we want to encourage them in their walk with the Lord, maybe introduce some who know very little about the Lord, maybe they've never been in a church, and so we hope to have 50 to 60 out here, and, and we'll have a good time, but if you could help us out that week, that would be great. There's a sign up in the entryway, and we're just going to show a little short video clip just to kind of get us excited about Vacation Bible School, so sit back and watch the video clip. I was given a, a few prayer requests just to share those. Uh, Donna's recovering from surgery. We want to remember Donna. Uh, Dave Hochstetler's mother and sister is traveling to Texas, so we want to pray for their safety. Uh, Helga fell, and so she's in a nursing home now, and so we want to remember Helga. I'm sure she's real thrilled about that. Uh, Justin is going to go to the Mayo Clinic on the 15th and they're going to maybe try some new radiation and so we want to remember Justin and, and the doctors at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, we also want to pray for VBS that it's a success. Uh, any other prayer requests anyone wants to share? If not, let's uh, take a minute in prayer. <coughs> Father, we're grateful that you demonstrate your love to us in so many ways. Father, you know our needs better than we know them ourselves. For those that are mentioned, we ask for strength and healing, uh, not only physically, but spiritually. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen.
Morning. <clears throat> We've been studying the book of Mark in Sunday school for several months. The past, the past few weeks, uh, we've been reading about the arrest of Jesus and all that leads up to the cross. We've been talking a lot about why different things happened the way they did and why the disciples could never quite understand what Jesus was telling them. Why did Judas betray him? Did he have a choice? Why did the rest of the disciples continue to fail? Why was this the time right for all this to happen? The answer goes right along with what Brian is about preaching about today, wisdom. God's infinite knowledge and wisdom gave him the insight to enact his plan of salvation at the exact right time. He sees the whole picture all the time, something we rarely do. The disciples struggled with this quite often. They failed because they got caught up in the moment and their earthly ideas rather than God's and his plan. The Jews were looking for an earthly king, someone to overthrow Rome and restore Israel to its rightful place. Many of the followers of Jesus also had issues with the ruling class of the Jews, the religious leaders. They wanted things set right with them also. This conquering king is who they wanted. Jesus was not that. He was a lamb led to the slaughter. This Messiah is not what they wanted, and they had a hard time understanding what he was doing. Small picture versus big. The irony is, if God had given them what they wanted instead of what we needed, none of us would have been saved. That is the wisdom of God. He made us, knew we were going to fail, created a plan of salvation, and let us choose to follow him or not. While he was teaching, Jesus tried to impart great amounts of wisdom to anyone who would listen. He tried to teach them to see the big picture, to see beyond just themselves. It was hard for the people at that time to understand, and they failed quite often. Their faith tended to waver. We are much the same. So how would we gain wisdom if those who were taught personally by Jesus struggled to acquire it? Believe and trust in the God who made you. Believe and trust in the God who saves you. Believe and trust in the God who loves you. Look for the big picture. If you, you do these things and follow his way, wisdom will be yours. He sent his son to die for our sins so that we might spend forever with him. Be wise and accept his offer of grace. Let's pray. Almighty God, Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all the blessings and wonderful things you've done for us. We thank you so much for the son that you sent to die in our stead. We can never repay the debt we owe. We thank you so much for the love you've given. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
this opportunity to give these blessings and gifts and offerings back to you. Pray that you will bless the gift and the giver. In your name we ask this. We start a new series today, so sometimes a new change of season begins a new series. So we'll spend four weeks in the book of Proverbs. I don't know if you've picked up your Bibles and read Proverbs lately, but uh, it's a great book, and we want to encourage you to do that, and I'll explain kind of what we'll be doing as a church project with that, uh, that short little book, but uh, a great book. We missed you last week. Barb and I were gone. We met our son Wade up in Wisconsin where we like to go, and we were able to camp and fish and enjoyed being outside. Had a little rain, not too bad, but we enjoyed it, and it was our 29th anniversary. And uh, so we celebrated 29 years and got to laugh and, well, I mean, pretty romantic getaway, wouldn't you agree? You know, and uh, we got to laugh and when Dorothy Berry passed away and the family was making funeral arrangements with Smith's Funeral Home there, and, and uh, we were just talking through things, and they talked about how Jean took Dorothy fishing on her honeymoon, on their honeymoon, and they just got to laughing and giggling about that and said, can you believe that? <laughs> and I said, yep, we went fishing on our honeymoon too, so anyway, so we enjoyed the getaway. We did miss being with you. Thankful that Brady was here and sounded like a great uh, Sunday that you had last week with him, and so we appreciate his wisdom, what we'll be talking about today, and, and I know you were challenged by that, so thanks, Brady. We enjoy, most of you know, we enjoy being outdoors. You can pull up that first slide if you want. And um, last fall, Barb and I took a week of vacation and went to the Boundary Waters. This is a map that you get when you go to the Boundary Waters. When we go to Wisconsin, we start up here and we just go down the river. There's no choices to make. There's no problems. You just, where the river goes, you go. And you camp along the river and you get out at an appropriate spot. You can't get lost. Well, the Boundary Waters was a little different story up there. These are all these lakes. And basically, they dropped us off and said, we'll see you in seven days and meet us back here. And so we had this route pre-planned pretty much. And, and the red spots are campsites. And the, the very top, you can see red slashes. Hopefully, that's the Canadian border and that's the boundary waters. So anyway, it's just the two of us and there's nobody around. And um, we go, wow, this is going to be good, I think. And, and uh, so we work our way down, and we're following our map, and we're navigating through this, and, and you have to go from one lake to the next. You know, there's not roads. No, no, lakes aren't marked like Holiday Lake. I mean, you know, it's not that way. There's no signs. There's no nothing. You just find your way. Well, Barb was reading the map, <laughs> and we got on the wrong lake. It was, there was a couple of choices to make, and they both were, they, they call their portage as five rods, and that's 16 feet. You guys probably know that better than I do, but, and, and we saw five, that must be it. It's a short portage. It was just, you know, from the length of our church, basically, and we picked it up and went to that lake, and we're, we're paddling around, and we're like, I don't see where the next portage, you know, that lake, we had, we're supposed to go to the next lake from that, and we're looking over like, we can't find it. You know, sometimes it's late in the season, it's overgrown, and and we just can't find it. And we're like, man, this is harder than we thought. You know, we're, we're going to be in trouble here. And finally we figured out there's campsites marked on the lake and there was no campsites in the spots that were supposed to be. And we backtracked and we figured out we'd made a wrong turn and got back. up. But we didn't get as far as we wanted. That slowed us up probably two hours that day. So we, we didn't make our first destination, which was no big deal. We had plenty of times. But it's sort of hard navigating through that. I mean, it wasn't as easy as it sounds, and, and those lakes are big, and there's not well marked, and, and so you have to make choices, navigate. Let's go to the next slide. Some of you will be familiar with a GPS. You probably like that. You know, some changes we don't like, but some of us like some of these changes, and, and you might have a GPS on your phone, you might have it in your vehicles, and it comes in very handy when you're in a large city, and, and our son in Philadelphia did some driving for the college that he goes to, and, and um, he was very thankful for a GPS in downtown Philadelphia. He didn't know his way, and it guided him, and he got on to where they needed to go. Some of you like that. You, you punch in your address and your destination, and it navigates 
most of the time correctly, not always, and a voice tells you where to go. Isn't that sort of what life is about, navigating through life? It's a series of choices. And sometimes you're not sure where to go, and sometimes people don't even care what their choices are. They just sort of go. But really, it takes some skill. And God's Word isn't given to us just for fun reading. It's given to us to help navigate through this thing we call life. And so I want to just challenge you to read God's Word afresh, and we're going to do the book of Proverbs this month, and there's just so much good stuff in there. There really is, and it helps us navigate through life. Wisdom is what we're going to be talking about today, and, and we're not really born with that, I don't think. I mean, I think sometimes people are born more intelligent a little bit than others or whatever, but wisdom sort of is acquired, and it has to do with making decisions. And I've said it before, the most spiritual thing about you isn't your prayer time, it isn't your Bible reading, the most spiritual thing about you is your decision making. Think about the wise person that you know, the wisest person you know, or a wise person. They've made godly decisions most of their life. It wasn't based on income, it wasn't based on their past, it wasn't based on, it's based on the decisions they make. And what's great about that, that is you can make that decision, you, you can make those same decisions. When you have help navigating, you become godly, you become wise. And so that should be encouraging to each of us here. I'm going to go out on a limb and say we probably all struggle with navigational issues at times through life. A poor choice made years ago might be still affecting us today. Maybe it was more than one choice. Maybe it was a recent choice. And it sort of got us off track. And we weren't able to make it to the destination or we aren't on the right path. Maybe we know somebody that's made that. Maybe it's not just one choice. Maybe it was just a season of life, a period of time where one choice just led to another choice. And it was just sort of this spiral and it was just, just this fog you were in. And, and you were in this season of life where it was just a a series of poor choices, and it, and it costs you in some ways, maybe relationally or whatever it might be. Could have been a, a poor financial decision. Could have been a, a selfish decision. Could have been a decision based on pride. Could have been a hurtful or revenge decision, decision to get even with somebody or back at somebody. And it seems like sometimes those decisions lead to more poor decisions and then we wonder, as we look back, and we go, wow, how did I get to where I was going? This is where I wanted to go. I, I got on the wrong lake somewhere, and I'm lost. Proverbs. I think they help us navigate through life, even though it was written 3,000 years ago. It still holds so much truth to us today. Let me just read, and I just picked these out randomly. Blessed are those who are generous because they feed the poor. Simple little proverb, but it's true. Just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. Wow, do we live in a world that has a debt problem? The borrower is servant to the lender. Most of us have experienced that, whether it's a vehicle or a house or property or whatever it is. We understand that truths to be shared so we try to manage our debt or we try to minimize or we try to have no debt it's a, it's a spiritual problem whoever walks with the wise will become wise whoever walks with fools will suffer harm who you choose as your friends is a pretty important deal and we like to say that's mostly for our teenagers but uh, um, that's true for all of us our friends are very important we understand that we probably can look back at times in our lives where we were with friends who were maybe uh, questionable in some ways, and, and we suffered the consequences that we got in trouble. Or maybe we were those people, I don't know. A gossip tells secrets, so don't hang around with someone who talks too much. A bowl of soup with someone you love is better than a steak with someone you hate. Proverbs fifteen seventeen. These are from the New Living Translation. It's harder to make amends with an offended friend than to capture a fortified city. Arguments separate friends like a gate locked with iron bars. 
You ever suffered that in relationally with a good friend and something was done and it's just so hard to repair sometimes relationships? Pride leads to arguments. Those who take advice are wise. We need to be learners. So the next four weeks, we're going to spend some time in this book of Proverbs. Hopefully we find truth. and We don't find it. We apply it. We put it into action. And all of a sudden, over time, we experience godly wisdom. And it pays great dividends. Again, book of Proverbs written 3,000 years ago, 900 years before Christ. And yet it's still helpful. King Solomon was responsible for writing most of this. Um, and yet, as we discovered on Mother's Day, he did not write the Proverbs 31. That was, well, we don't think he did anyway. And so there were some other writers, but Proverbs, or, uh, Proverbs was mostly written by King Solomon. Over 900 of them listed in this book. We won't be covering them all. Um, but they all are, Proverbs are timeless truths. I mean, they, they weren't good just 3,000 years ago. Most of them are very true today. Um, they're not always a promise. Sometimes we think of these as promises, that they're more of a, oh, a guide. I mean, not everything is exactly 100%. It's just a, it's just a premise. Um, and, um, but they're not temporary advice. They're good yesterday, today, and they're good for tomorrow. They're easy to remember. Here's some non-biblical proverbs. Two wrongs don't make a... They're easy to remember. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. See, we're easy to remember these. You can't judge a book by its cover. Those are proverbs. A penny saved is a penny. Those are timeless truths. They're helpful for us. They help navigate. Those aren't even biblical. But they're helpful. Proverbs is a helpful book. It's useful. So what I want you to do, I'm asking you to bring your Bibles every week. We like you to do that anyway, but it's just a reminder, bring your Bible every week. And what I want you to do is bring a pen or a highlighter or something. You can underline something that God's speaking to you in, the, in these Proverbs. Today, we're not going to tackle a big section of, of Scripture, and most of the time we won't as we go through Proverbs. But I think that's just a great practice for you to do. As I looked at my Bible this morning, there's... In the first three or four chapters, there's six or seven that I have highlighted that are important to me. And it's fun to look back at those and read those. And, and God has used those somehow. So I want to encourage you, bring a marker, bring a Bible, mark it up. This is our verse for the day. It's a great, great verse. It should be highlighted, underlined. It should be memorized. So anyway, lots of truths. They give us a glimpse of uh, what's important. Um, we live in a day... Well, there's never been more information available to us ever. Got a question? We just get on the computer and Google it, and we usually find a pretty good answer. I like to tell our boys, we graduated without Google, all right? That's our claim to fame, our generation. But we have more information. We have more information about the Bible. We have more information about anything. Uh, it's at our fingertips. And yet, look at the world we're in. And it doesn't take long to see... There, there's a lack of wisdom in our world. Look at the political scene. Wisdom and politics, those two words don't go very well hand in hand. We were at, we were at Barb's folks, and 90-some years old, we were talking about the presidents, and he's 92 years old, and I just think, that generation is just blown away by who we have, and I'm not trying to be political, I don't ever do that, but their idea of president is so different than our idea of president, and to me it's just a lack of wisdom on our part. There's, we, we, lack, we have more information than ever before, but it seems like wisdom is a rarity. Someone said we are drowning in information but starving for wisdom. I think that's true. So hopefully, God's word will help us become wiser these next four weeks. It kind of all began back in 1 Kings 3 when the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream. And he says, whatever you want, what is it you want? I will grant it to you. 1 Kings 3. What would you ask for? And this is what Solomon says. And now, O Lord my God, you have made me your servant king in place of David. David was his father. And he says, although I'm, uh, I am but a little child, I do not 
know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this, your great people? Basically saying, I, I don't know how to do this. He said, I'm young. I don't know how to govern. I want a wise, I want an understanding heart. And so that's where Solomon gets it. And if you were to read more in that King's passage, you'd see that God grants him that. It was a wise choice on his part. And he gives him even more than he asked for. And so that's sort of where it all began. He asked for this discerning heart, and he gets a bonus thrown in. So let's go ahead, turn to Proverbs with all that introduction. Turn to Proverbs chapter 1, and we're going to just read the first seven verses. If you don't know where Proverbs is, if you just open your Bible to the middle, it's, you're going to come very close. If it's Psalms, just turn forward a little bit, and Proverbs will be right there. So it's right about in the center of your Bible, maybe a little bit to the right of the center. But um, Proverbs chapter 1. We're just going to read the verse 7 verses. Again, I want to encourage you to bring a pencil or a highlighter or a pen and, and highlight those in your Bible. Starting in verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction. To understand words of insight. To receive instruction in wise dealing. In righteousness, justice, and equity. To give prudence to the simple. Knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning. To the one who understands, obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, there are words of the wise and their riddles. And there's the verse I want us to really concentrate on or think through. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Words like wisdom, discipline, prudence, understanding, guidance. Those are strong words, and those are the words that we just read. Proverbs was written uh, sort of as fatherly advice to a son. And uh, he didn't want his son just to know things. As dads, we don't want our sons just to know things. We want them to apply the truths that they're taught. That's what Solomon wanted for his people. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Been there? Ever had a lack of discipline in your life? We've been there. Proverbs helps us in this area. It all begins with a healthy respect, a healthy reverence for God Almighty. That's where wisdom comes. When we have a proper perspective of who we are and who God is, that's the beginning of knowledge. That's wisdom. The universe was set up by Him, but I think sometimes in our society we have lost a fear of God. And I can remember wondering, what does that mean? Am I supposed to be afraid of God? You know, what, what's that fear of God mean? As a kid, you read that verse and you go, I don't, are you supposed to be afraid of God? And I think sometimes, in some ways, we should be more afraid of God than we are. He's mighty and He's powerful. But that word, uh, easiest to understand, and is, is a respect. A respect for our God. That's how we balance that out. Maybe you have an earthly father that you that was a wise man not everybody is so lucky but maybe you understand that uh, there was a respect for your dad a fear and you knew if you screwed up you were going to pay a price that's a little bit of fear but you also knew that he was very loving and very forgiving so we understand a little bit of that if you are fortunate to have a godly father unfortunately we live in a world well, that's not always the case. We're going to look at that in a couple weeks as we look and see what Proverbs says about being a dad. I think of fear. What are things that you fear in this biblical term? I do woodworking. I have a couple of pieces of equipment. I have a shaper that's big and has a big motor on it, and there's big blades that spin at 10,000 RPMs, and it's there's a fear in me a little bit. I have a healthy respect, and I use guards, and I, and I take safety precautions. You guys that farm, you have a fear somewhat of, of your big tractors. There's, there's a respect. You understand the power. You understand what can happen if you're not careful because there's a, a respect. There's a fear of, of that. We understand that, and that's the way it is with God. There's a fear 
an honest respect for who he is. And we've, we've sort of just reversed roles with God sometimes. We think he's here to bless us. You know, that's all we think of God. But that's not why we were created, just to receive his blessing. But wisdom starts with a healthy fear of the Lord. Here's our church challenge. I want you to read through the book of Proverbs, and this, it's an easy one. I, I sometimes think I'm going to answer to God for not being more challenging to you. But I want you to read a proverb a day. That's it. It takes four minutes, five minutes. I know we're busy, but I'm asking you four or five minutes. You can do this. We, we could have 100% participation in this. And so today is the fifth. Is the fifth, is that right? Yes. Today is the fifth. You would read Proverbs chapter 5 today. You should be able to remember that. Tomorrow's the sixth. You would read chapter 6. And so there's 31 days. Uh, June doesn't go very well, so on June 30th you can read chapter June 30 and 31, especially the ladies, you know, Proverbs 31 ladies. You know, we talked about that. And so what we're going to do is uh, a month from now, we're going to just challenge you to have read through Proverbs. It's very, very simple, but I think it's very, very helpful. Billy Graham says, I read five psalms a day and a Proverbs a day. Reading through the Psalms helped me with my relationship with God. Reading through Proverbs helped me with my relationship with man. It's going to help you. It's going to be useful. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I want you to get on our Facebook page and, and say, this was my favorite proverb of the day. And type out that verse. And just share it with one another and receive an encouragement. You might forget a day. We're not going to be legalistic about this. We just want to encourage you. It'd be a fun church project to read through Proverbs each day. Maybe you're currently reading scripture, and I'm asking you to add this to your Bible reading. That would be great. But I also know some of you have probably grown lax in that, and this might be a new beginning. Easy to remember, easy to read. Find four or five minutes and uh, mix in some prayer with that, and let that apply to your life. I think it'll be fun. It will help us navigate through life. Short chapters, easy to read. Wisdom, you know, I think, how's this going to help my life? How's this going to, this helps with, in the area of temptation. If you're, if you're tempted by something, there's times Proverbs comes to my mind, and it helps me as I make decisions. And so if you're struggling with something, Proverbs might help you overcome a temptation that you face. And I got to thinking as I prepared for this, so what's the end result? So we, we become more godly. Is that, is that what this is all about, that we just become more godly? So people can say, wow, look at him. He's a God. That's, that's, not, that's not what we're hoping for here. When we become more godly, people see Jesus. And people see the Lord. And so our goal isn't that we become godly so people can praise us. We become more godly so people can say, wow, God is good. God is good. And so it's really not about us. It's about a great God. And so keep that in mind as we prepare and as we read. One of the hardest parts, and maybe you've beat me to this spot, is that if you know Solomon's life, he didn't always practice what he preached. And he shared all these great truths, and yet if you've studied his life at all, he had some messed up things. His relationships weren't all that good. And so sometimes it's a struggle as we, as pastors or other professions, sometimes we say, do as I say, not as I do. You know, it's the overweight doctor that tells you to lose weight, and you kind of go, yeah, right. You need to exercise. Yeah, right. Tell me about it, doctor. Or the, the banker who's in debt up to his ears and, and tells you this, or whatever it might be. The, the car salesman who drives a 96 Buick, you know. And, uh, um, but sometimes we're that way. And Solomon, Solomon made some mistakes. And didn't follow his own words. And we all understand that. We've, we've been there and done that. As parents, we've been able to tell our kids, don't do this. And yet, sometimes our lives didn't match up. But we want to become more godly. And man, America needs godly men. Godly women. Godly parents. In the worst of ways. And I speak selfishly. I got two boys. They're not dating anyone but you start thinking about grandkids at some point in time. And so sometimes I plead selfishly as a, as a pastor, we need godly parents. We need godly grandparents in the worst of ways. And I think God will bless 
each community, each church, each city begins to focus on godliness. And we might say, well, you know, no one else is going to do it. I don't care. Madison, we're, we're going to give God a chance. And we're going to become more godly. And we're going to become more wise. And we'll see what happens. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, well-known, popular passage. Some of you probably have it memorized. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. But we don't often add verse 7 to that. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Fear the Lord. It's the beginning of wisdom. Don't be wise in your own eyes. You're never too old to learn. Let God's Word teach you again a healthy respect, a reverence for an all-knowing, all-powerful God. So let this letter change you. Let it mold you. Um, perhaps God has something in mind for you as you read through a proverb a day for the next 30 days. So uh, Madison, let's take the challenge. Not that we can receive glory so that God can receive glory. Out in the lobby, I only had about 12. They don't make them anymore, and they're just little books of Proverbs, and some of them are already gone. If you want to grab one, take one. Most of us have access to a Bible. There's a book of Proverbs. It's no different. It's just that those little books are simple and easy to use. If you want to grab them, grab them all up. They don't make them anymore, and so grab one and use them, but they may be gone already. But uh, check in. Don't forget, get on Facebook and, and post your favorite verse, and let's just use this as an encouragement for a church family. Again, where does wisdom begin? Acknowledging a reverence and a fear for your Creator. That's where wisdom begins. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful that uh, you breathed these words into Solomon so many years ago and 3,000 years ago, and, and yet they're still so helpful and so true. So help us to uh, be disciplined enough uh, to take time to read your word and to let it soak in. So help us as a church family as we embark on this short little Proverbs journey. May it be delightful and may it be joyful, but may it be convicting and, and may it help us become wiser as we deal with people and in relationships and as we deal with sons and daughters or aging parents or whatever season of life we, we might be in. I know that your word speaks to those issues. So help us to become Godly men and women, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we close today. Yeah.